Hello, I'm Dr. Jennifer Jackson. I'm a registered nurse and assistant professor in the Faculty of Nursing at the University of Calgary. And um, this is a video that goes through the basics of literature reviews. So we're going to talk about how, what literature reviews are and how they're useful for nursing. Got a little bit of glare going today, but I've got my wise owl scarf on. So hopefully we're inspired to learn lots about literature reviews here. So we're going to cover what is a literature review, how do these reviews inform practice, and what are the different types. We're not going to discuss in great detail how to actually do one. Um, this is a very formal and systematic process. So the goal today is to give an overview so that if you're looking for um, an answer to a clinical question, you know what kind of review you might want to find, and you can search for that quickly, use that review, and um, apply that evidence in practice. So there are many, many, many studies that are published every day. There's been huge with the evidence-based practice movement that started in the early 2000s, there's been a huge proliferation of journals, journal articles, and research in um, the healthcare world. Um, nursing is also the fastest growing domain of publishing um, in the world. And so um, the research in nursing is ramping up exponentially, which means there's a huge volume and you could never ever keep up with all of it. And also as clinicians, we're not expected to. We want to provide the best care we can and use the best information we have to do that. And literature reviews are one way to, um, to try and manage some of this volume of information. So we need to be very clear that there is a literature review and there is reviewing the literature. So a literature review is a formal systematic process that has a specific name, specific goals, and very detailed steps you need to follow. So it's not what you do when you're Googling something on your computer. A literature review is a formal systematic process. Reviewing the literature, that might refer to Googling on your computer or, or you know, going to a database like CINAHL, looking up a few things and using that in maybe a paper you're writing. So it's just helpful to have those two things separate um, so that when what we're going to talk about today is formal systematic reviews of the literature and how those pieces of secondary research can inform practice. One thing literature reviews do is widen the context of studies. So to have a manageable and effective research study, the context needs to be quite small. So you might want to look at the impact of um, pressure relieving mattresses on pressure ulcer reduction for um, patients who have cancer and who are inpatients in the hospital. So that is a manageable size of a research study. For a review, you could look at studies that look at um, the use of pressure relieving mattresses for all inpatients. So it's feasible to widen the context of what you're talking about to really bring in all the evidence that you can to inform practice. Now you don't want it to be too wide, but you can go beyond an individual study or an individual setting to look at broader literature. So what literature reviews do is consolidate evidence to inform policy and practice. So when someone is writing a literature review, they create a question, and we'll talk a little bit more um, towards the end about how you create that question. So they create a question and then search in a formal stepwise manner for literature about that question. What you do then is sort the studies and the results that you find. So some of them are relevant, some of them are not relevant. And you're going to take all the studies that are relevant that meet your, what we call the inclusion criteria that are determined ahead of time. So all the studies that meet those criteria, you're gonna put them together and say, across this body of literature, um, what, 
do we know about this topic? Then based on that review and what you do when, when you bring all those research studies together, what answers might you get for questions and how does that relate to practice? Now, literature reviews are not the only definitive answer. You still need to, to adapt care to meet the needs of individual patients. However, um, a literature review can provide a benchmark of this is the best evidence in this area we have available. And this is what we can recommend based on this evidence. So looking at the different types of literature reviews. Um, so I'll briefly go through each one just to talk a little bit about the different features. Same as with research methods, they all do slightly different things. Um, you can also think about this like um, McDonald's, Burger King, Wendy's, a and Harvey's, I could go on. They all serve burgers and fries, basically. But within that, there's slight differences, like a Big Mac versus a Whopper. So um, you don't necessarily have to memorize these, but it's useful to be familiar with the idea that one does not equal another. And um, when you are saying, I need to find some evidence, it might be helpful to refer back to this and say, okay, what kind of evidence is it that I'm looking for? And therefore, what review might be helpful? So scoping reviews, um, they look at the breadth of literature available about a topic. So I got a couple of these and they are really handy when um, you have a topic that has not been very researched or you're trying to get the range of studies. So what is everything we're talking about in this situation? Scoping reviews often inform research studies, maybe less so practice, because with a scoping review, you don't assess the quality of the individual studies. You look at what do we know, what is out there? So this is great for when you're starting a big project. It's also great for when very little is known about a topic. Within a scoping review, you would include any types of publications. So it could be um, discussion papers, uh, research studies, methods papers, anything that applies, anything that you find that meets your inclusion criteria, you would um, have as part of your analysis. So this is good to get a broad understanding of like, what is this topic? What has been written about it? And then now what kind of research do you wanna do? A systematic review, I'm gonna discuss in detail in the next slide because the systematic review has taken over as the gold standard for um, informing clinical practice. And there's good things and bad things about that. Um, on one hand, a systematic review is the most rigorous synthesis um, that we have available. It's the most rigorous technique to answer specific practice questions. So you would create a very specific question. So what is the best treatment um, for acne among adolescents? Um, and you want to specify if it's an oral treatment or a topical oral topical treatment. And then you could search for that. You search exhaustively. You comb databases to find anything that might be relevant. Then you go through, exclude studies or include studies. You check the quality of all of those studies um, so that you know whether the evidence is good quality or not. So you appraise each article. And then from that, you get quite a definitive answer to inform clinical practice. The down, so the upside is that this process is as thorough and rigorous as it can possibly be. The downside is this takes a team of probably about five people at minimum. They can take a year to do and only include quantitative research. So you're excluding qualitative research in most cases, which um, the people who love quantitative research love it, but qualitative research also adds to our understanding of the phenomenon. And you might be missing important things. 
Um, so systematic reviews are especially helpful for like prescribing or specific kinds of interventions. They're less helpful for understanding the experience that people go through or the best way to provide um, support or, or different types of skills. Um, rapid reviews are the younger cousin of a systematic review, and the aim there is to deal with emerging clinical issues and to get some information quickly. And so you don't go to the same exhaustive lengths as you would for a systematic review. You go a little bit shorter and look for what is the main findings on this. So there would have been tons of these done in the early days of COVID-19. That's a perfect example of like there is an emergent need and now we need to respond to that. So what in literature can we find that we can do something in six weeks rather than a year? So you'll see um, rapid reviews are a technique to try and for, for studying clinical issues to try and generate evidence quickly. Um, a meta-ethnography is a way of consolidating findings around qualitative research. So qualitative research is left out from the systematic uh, review conversation for the most part. There are exceptions where you'll see a systematic review that includes qualitative research, um, but these are less common. So a meta-ethnography um, consolidates qualitative findings and what so, so we're going to talk about metasynthesis in a minute. So not to get those confused with a meta ethnography, what someone is doing is going back to the participant quotes that are used in a research study and going as granular as possible and synthesizing that information. So they wouldn't necessarily take an author's themes. They would go back to the quotes and the presentation of, um, of ideas in an article. A tricky thing here is that a meta-ethnography does not necessarily have ethnography as one of the study methods that is required. So you can include a grounded theory study or a phenomenological study in a meta-ethnography. So don't be thrown off by the name. Meta-ethnography is for consolidating findings about a quali qualitative work about a topic and it's not necessarily specific to the ethnographic method. So it can consolidate what we know about an experience or a culture. So maybe what is it like to, um, to have uh, a transition from adolescence to adulthood? That would be a great kind of meta-ethnography piece because then you could look at, you know, widen the context, you could look at individuals in different contexts, but they're still experiencing the same phenomenon. So in theory, metaethnography can contribute to practice. This is less common, um, but it, qualitative research is rigorous and it is well conducted for the most part. And so it can make contributions to nursing practice. Our next review is a meta-narrative or realist review. So meta-narrative and realist, they're not interchangeable. I've grouped them here because they both look at similar types of questions. And when you're first meeting this topic, you don't need to know the depth of like every single element of each one of those. Basically, you look at how did we get to be this way? What is happening here? How did this evolve? And so um, I've done a meta narrative review and I looked at 120 some studies that talked about nursing work. So I went all the way back to 1953 up to 2020 and I searched for studies of nursing work and I looked across this 70 year span of research and said, how have we talked about nursing work and how has this discussion changed? So um, I found that over time, the view of nursing work has become increasingly fragmented. So we're looking at specific pieces of it, but not the whole of what a nurse does um, has, during a typical day. 
instead we're looking at um, the emotional labor, the organizational labor, all these individual pieces. So that was what I talked about in terms of what the narrative was. So that's what a narrative can do. So if we wanted to look at um, how do we understand in, why young people take up smoking or vaping, we might look at a narrative over time that at one point said, um, you know, they're making bad choices because they are bad people. Then we got into a more individual lens and now maybe we're looking at a social construction of behavior. And so, um, I mean, I haven't done that review. It might not go exactly like that, but that example is to illustrate. We're looking at the story and how it changed more than what is the most useful way to, um, to avoid pressure ulcers. So um, with meta narrative reviews, you can include different kinds of publications. And um, sometimes you can also include things that aren't empirical peer reviewed evidence. So like reports, um, that varies depending on what the goals are of that type of review. The last one I'll talk about here is a, an integrative review, which basically gives you a comprehensive understanding of a topic. So that might be something like um, patient-centered care. I don't think I'd ever want to do a review on that because it would be so massive, it would be impossible. But something like patient-centered care, an integrative review would say, what do we know about this thing? What is the current state of the science about this thing? So integrative review is distinct because it includes research and also non-research articles. So you could have discussion papers and you could also have empirical papers. So as you can see, like an integrative review and a scoping review might include the same types of articles in them, but the aim of those reviews is different. So a scoping review you would use when it's a new topic and you don't know, there isn't that much published evidence about it. Whereas an integrative review is you're bringing together ideas in a space that's more well studied to say what is the state of the art of this science currently. So, so depending on what you need and what you're trying to find out, you might look for different types of reviews or you might find different types of reviews helpful in different contexts. Um, pro tip is that if you are writing a paper for nursing school, find a review on the topic and then use articles from that review to inform your writing because a review is probably gonna have at least four and up to you know 50 articles that are included and they're all about the same topic. So it gives you a great little space to find a lot of recent research that's already been summarized for you. So you don't always wanna do that, but it can be a little bit of a, a starter to help you find evidence that's related to something that's interesting for you. So just to give a little more attention to a systematic review. So it is the exhaustive effort to produce definitive answers. And um, a former colleague of mine wrote a paper called The Rise and Rise of Systematic Reviews. Um, systematic reviews are not going anywhere. They are, um, they are the driving force of the evidence-based practice movement. And um, they form the basis of a lot of our clinical decision-making. Um, particularly around prescribing or specific interventions. And so systematic reviews form the basis for like decision trees, algorithms, knowing what to do in different situations. So um, if you have a clinical question, the Cochrane Library is the keeper of systematic reviews. Every systematic review that's being done or has been done um, is registered with the Cochrane Library. So if you're in practice, you're working in the hospital and you want to try and find something quickly, stay away from Google and Wikipedia, go to the Cochrane Library because you know you're gonna find something that is conducted rigorously and has a precise answer. Um, I think that's all I wanna say about systematic reviews. They are, they are a lot of work. They are considered secondary research because they are such a substantial undertaking, but they can be really valuable. They don't answer all the questions we have, 
but this is the foundational type of literature review that's used to inform clinical practice right now. So you'll also see with the review, if the review is the burger, the meta is the fries. <laughs> so there's different meta things that tend to go with reviews. Now, I appreciate this is a little complicated because a couple of slides ago, we were talking about meta narrative and meta ethnography. These meta analysis and meta synthesis are slightly different. So um, the first ones on the previous slide, those are types of, of formal literature reviews. These are techniques that are used inside a literature review. Um, so you may see something like a systematic review with meta-analysis. So it means we have the technique of a systematic review plus we're adding meta-analysis on. So meta-analysis is the statistical synthesis um, from the studies that are in a systematic review. So what you can do is go through all of these randomized controlled trials, and if the questions are precise enough and the methods are, you know, if all these trials are done well, you can take the outcome data from each individual trial and aggregate it together. So you can go from maybe having a randomized control trial with an experimental group of 50 people. Well, if you've got a bunch of those studies, you could then have a meta-analysis that takes into account data from 500 people or 800 people instead of the 50 that are in a single trial. So essentially, you take all the statistics from all the studies and combine them to create a new analysis that gives you a high degree of mathematical precision about what is the best thing to do. Um, this is really hard. I hope I never have to do it, <laughs> but my hat, I tip my hat to everybody who does because meta-analyses provide a very high quality answer to clinical questions about how do we do something? What should we do? What is the best treatment we have available? This is, this is where we get an answer. A metasynthesis or meta aggregation is similar to um, the meta analysis, except that it looks at thematic synthesis with qualitative studies. So when we talked about meta ethnography, we said that someone goes directly from like the participant quotes, the most granular level and combines studies that way. With a meta synthesis, you look at what themes an author has identified for a phenomenon and then combine those. Or it might also be categories if you're talking about um, grounded theory, but whatever the, the unit that the researcher creates, the one that has the interpretation, that's the level that's used for metasynthesis, not the really granular quotes. So what you would do is combine them all and say, this is what we have found about qualitative studies in this area. So sometimes metasynthesis is also called meta-aggregation, although I'm seeing that less commonly now. You can also have metasynthesis when you have a systematic review that includes qualitative research or um, if you have a mixed method systematic review, you might also have metasynthesis there. So some of these terms, like, like having the technique of meta-analysis and metasynthesis, this is within the past 10 years. This is quite new. And some of this language is still developing as to what exactly does it apply to. Um, so, but in, in, for our purposes here, we can say that metasynthesis is generally combining themes from qualitative studies to understand the broad picture of what is known qualitatively about a topic. So a meta-analysis would perhaps compare brain and scale scores for different types of pressure reducing mattresses to see um, what we could do to prevent pressure ulcers. That would be a really good type of meta-analysis. 
a metasynthesis, we might look at what are the experiences of patients in nurse-led clinics. And so we're broadening the context. A nurse-led clinic could be a sexual health clinic. It could be an addiction treatment clinic. But what are the experiences of patients in nurse-led clinics? So these are different ways that we can synthesize or bring together all the information from the studies that we have included in our literature review. So perhaps one of the best things to do is rather than kind of worrying too much about what does this mean and does this go with that, is when you find a study refer that you might think might be interesting or might relate to an area of practice you're, you're wondering about, refer back to tables like these and say, okay, meta-analysis means this, um, systematic review means this, and put the pieces together that way. We also have to get to go from meta to exponentially more meta. We have reviews of reviews. So a review of reviews um, consolidates reviews. So it takes systematic reviews from topics that are maybe slightly separate, but very much related and um, reviews those. So this is at a very advanced state of the science. So this is something where a lot of research has been done. There's lots of different studies in this area. And now we want to look at, you know, maybe what are, where are we at now and to provide recommendations for like the next generation of research in this area. So this example, um, if we think about our titles and the different kinds we've talked about, um, we can break down to say effectiveness of a flipped classroom in nursing education. So we're looking at the flipped classroom technique um, and we're doing a systematic review of systematic and integrative reviews. So we know a systematic review looks at primarily quantitative information. Integrative reviews look at both research and non-research. So when we see both systematic and integrative, that tells me they looked at quantitative research, qualitative research, and non-empirical articles, like discussion papers or opinion pieces or methods papers. So they considered a lot of those things. Then they did a systematic review for those. So wherever there's been a consolidation of knowledge around flipped classroom, they brought those all together. So this I know is gonna be a very high degree of evidence. Uh, my other clue is that it's published in the top nursing journal in the world. So between those two things, I think, okay, I can trust this information and the, the um, information I'm getting from this study can directly inform my practice. And that's exactly what it's doing. It says that flipped classroom is, is a broadly effective technique, which is why I'm recording this video right now so the students can watch it ahead of time. And then um, we can do active learning in class to unpack these ideas in a bit more detail. So this is what a review, re review of reviews looks like. It's, it's, it's kind of the high level system look at what we know about a science. And by the time you get to this point, you've got a pretty settled answer of, yes, flipped classroom is an effective technique or, or similar. So for our final point, um, we're gonna talk a little bit about how they do reviews. And this applies to reviews of any kind. For reviews, there are, there are tons of guidelines and tons of reporting checklists and everything else to the point where it is so precise that anything that gets published has to follow this pattern very, very closely. It's like a um, recipe that you have to follow to do a review. And the recipe is extremely, extremely detailed. So um, this is very broad brushstrokes just to give a sense of what goes into these papers. Um, but uh, if you want to take on a literature, a formal literature review, there's tons of detail that's available to talk about the specific, um, specific steps that you need. So for a formal review, you need to follow the precise directions. 
If you are looking for evidence that you want to write about in a paper or something like that, you can still borrow some ideas from how a literature review is conducted. You just don't necessarily need to go to the same lengths. So we have to generate a question, um, just as research answers a question, a review also answers a question. The most common framework used to um, inform reviews is PICO, so Population Intervention Outcome and Comparison. Sometimes it also has a T on the end for timeline. Um, there are a million different PICO variations. So the PICO example I've shared here refers to research that's done using randomized controlled trials. However, you could also have a variation that could be PCC, which is participants, context, and concepts. That works really well for something like a scoping review, where you're not necessarily looking at trials. You might not have a comparison group, or you might not be intervening. You might instead want to study people's experiences. So either way, you create a question that has to be very, very precise and very clear. So um, this process of creating a question is deceptively hard um, because you could say, okay, we want to look at interventions that nurses can use that are within the nursing scope of practice to reduce pressure ulcers. Well, what is a nurse? Is a nurse a registered nurse, a licensed practical nurse, a registered psychiatric nurse? Do we count a healthcare aide as a nurse? Um, are we talking about nursing being the same thing internationally? So um, there's a lot of kind of interrogating each idea that's included to say, what do you exactly mean? And the reason you go through that is so that when you find evidence, it's easy to sift through and say, yes, this is useful or no, this is not. So then you would search in a I'm trying to avoid using the word systematic. You would search in a systematic way um, through the databases or you use a very precise kind of approach. So you search the same search terms in each database and um, different databases have their own flavors. So for doing a meta-narrative review, I definitely wanted to include, include JSTOR because the JSTOR database um, includes a lot of social science. However, when I was looking at resilience engineering, I needed to include web of science because they include more of the natural sciences and that's where some of that discussion would be happening. So it's useful to know which database has which different types of information in it. So you can best target where you're gonna search for an answer to your question. So you're gonna find a whole bunch of research studies and then you'll filter them and say, this is relevant, this is not relevant. Um, currently, we're looking at doing a scoping review for needle debris, and that has brought up more not relevant things than I ever thought possible. We've had to separate out studies on tree needles. We've had to separate out studies on the type of needle you would use to provide treatment to a whale, everything and anything. So even though you kind of have a clear question, sometimes you can still get a mix of just about anything in the literature. So you go through this sifting process and you come up with a group of studies. You might have five, you might have 20, but you're probably gonna have a relatively small number. From those studies, you're gonna extract data. So what that means is you'll probably set up a table that has different categories across it and you'll pull out different parts of the study. So you list the design, you list the method, the participants, um, how data was collected, what the scores were, that kind of thing. And by doing that, you probably see those types of tables in published reviews. Um, it allows for easy comparison. So you have to go through each paper to set that table up. And then from there, you create new understanding. And that can be really useful because it goes from an individual research study to looking internationally, to looking in different healthcare services. And so if reviews are conducted well, you can have a very high degree of certainty that what they're sharing is um, 
is valuable and can be used in practice. Now, not all reviews are conducted well, so it isn't just a green light that you can go change what you're doing with patients just because you read something that said systematic review on it. But more and more, as long as the journal is credible, the, the net is getting very tight. So there's not a lot of bad ones slipping through anymore because there's this consensus that we all want to do this work really well because of how valuable it is in clinical practice. So find reviews on a topic of interest and um, take some time to go through them because they pack in a lot of really valuable information into a shorter space and can provide a lot of insights that can inform practice and hopefully help us provide better care to um, patients and families. All right, so that's a brief introduction to reviews. Thank you very much.